And I said, um, I'm Paola. Um, and uh, first of all, I want you guys to know that I really understand that a lot of people do not have the courage to study abroad because it had, it's, it's very difficult. It's a whole process and kind of thinking about how to finance can be so overwhelming. So I want to share with you guys how did I um, start with the idea of studying abroad. I was actually wanting to do a summer program with the Honors College of Faculty-led program um, since it was a requirement for graduation. And I, I'm on my own um, financially. My parents are from Mexico and they don't really understand the whole kind of like university aspect in the San Diego and they couldn't help me financially. So funding it was a, a really hard um, thing for me. And in that moment, I, I was actually let go, um, let go of my job and I was terrified. Oh my God, I thought I had to give up all my dreams of studying abroad. And thankfully the study abroad office and all the advisors they had really helped me kind of develop a plan to be able to study abroad. And so um, that's kind of like where my adventure began. And I, I've studied in two places actually. I had the opportunity to do almost everything was in scholarships. I studied abroad in Finland and I studied abroad in Italy. Um, and those opportunities actually helped me get an internship for um, France in Paris for next summer. So like this is something that really opens doors that you don't even have any idea that um, who they were there. So it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. And so I wanna talk a little about Finland. I was in Javascula. Um, Finland is very, very different <laughs> in all the aspects. Um, so I, I went with a small group of San Diego State students um, with the Honors College and we studied refugee and asylum resettlement and ling um, Finnish language and culture. And it was a very difficult thing. I had never been in Europe. I had never been outside Mexico or the US. Um, and it was really hard to adapt at first, um, especially because of the, it was a 10 hour, um, hour difference and like those small little things that you don't think that um, you can adapt to and you slowly start. Um, I had the opportunity to learn a lot from them. Um, culturally language. I was actually, by the time I left that summer, I spoke a little bit of Finnish. <laughs> I had to get around town um, and sometimes they didn't speak English, so I actually had to speak Finnish. And that was such an amazing, now looking back, to think I was a little bit of a Finnish myself. Um, and so I feel these fears um, are very common and students, especially first-generation students like ourselves. Um, number one, as a woman, I feel, especially from my Mexican background, you know, my uncles, my father, my grandparents, um, my mom, they were very afraid of me traveling alone as a woman. Um, because, you know, unfortunately, we live in a society where it's not safe all the time, you know, especially traveling um we have all seen or heard about take it um so it's it's a funny thing but this is a, like a serious fear that people have and i love that um when women especially decide that they're gonna study abroad and travel alone it's scary um and you know that was something that shocked me of being in finland that i was in one of the safest countries in the world where um it was so safe, it was incredible. I remember one night um, we were had a gathering at a bar with a lot of um, international exchange students and Finnish people of getting together. And I, I wanted to leave, it was for me, I wanted to go to bed and I had to return home alone and I was on my bike. And back when I went in the summer, Finnish do not have night, it's every day and night is daytime, the sun is out. So I remember I was walking um, while I was on my bike and the sunlight was, it was beautiful. It, it was just, it was like entering Narnia. And I remember um, 
there was a group of guys in front of me that I had to pass through and I was so scared. I was like, oh my God, why, what have I gotten myself into? I should have waited for someone to come with me. Like I was very, very nervous. And I remember uh, from afar, the guys saw me and they all made a single line. There were like five of them and like try to like stay away as far from me so that I could pass on my bike. And they were super respectful of it, of just like giving me space. Um, and you know, that was so shocking. It seemed like they understood that I was scared of, you know, I'm alone, I'm a woman. Um, I remember I was in Helsinki and I had my umbrella stolen and Finnish people were actually really upset. They apologized. They were like, no, it wasn't one of us. It was probably an international person. Like, you would never have that happen. And, you know, that was something that I never expected. And, you know, that goes into the culture shock. It is a different, um, a different country. It's something that, like I said, it was like entering Narnia where there was forests, you know, um, we had had an incident where children were very common that they're alone in Finland and a bear um, kind of got a little too close to a girl that was coming alone and she played dead and the bear left her alone. So, you know, it's a little, it's different. Um, the food, the people, the customs, like they will not get an elevator with you if like they don't do that. They're very mindful of space or they won't say good morning or hello and you know it's different um also i had never been in a country where i did not speak the language um and that terrified me you know because finnish is really hard it's a complex language they not all the time speak english um i must say they do speak a better spanish than most countries which i found that odd um but, you know, you slowly start adapting. You know, people are very nice, especially if they know that you're lost. And even just making signs, you know, you you get around, especially now with technology, um, you can really, really um, get yourself through, even with Google. Um, so I feel that was something I, I wish I had told myself, like, to not be scared of not understanding, like, you will get through. Um, and something I really want to touch on is, um, racism, like I said, I was studying um, refugee of a resettlement, so we viewed a very kind of um, difficult aspects of um, integrating into a new culture. And I, I do not look Finnish. <laughs> I am not tall, I, I'm not pale, I don't have very blonde hair. And I remember a lot of people would stare at me. Um, People, Finnish people will not talk to you, but they will stare. Um, and I remember it was very intimidating for me. I felt I was, I was in a hostile environment. I didn't feel comfortable. And it wasn't until kind of like half the summer that I started making Finnish friends. And, you know, from that first experience of my first Finnish girlfriend, um, when she told me like, oh my God, we have been staring at you for a week or two trying to like decipher where you're from and, like they walk me through kind of like their mind of okay you could be from here or you could be because of your skin but you don't have the eyes and hearing that from them gave me a whole different perspective where i felt i judged them too hard that sometimes people are literally just curious you know i was exotic in their country and that's something that will happen that maybe the country you're going to, they have never seen a person like you. And that might be weird for you. Um, I de definitely felt very flattered when they told me they found me very beautiful and like pretty, um, but that's something that happened. So be, um, have a bit of an open mind, do not be afraid of talking to them. You know, sometimes my version was completely different. Um, so it's not always what things seem. Um, and I want to show you guys this. Um, this was my path to class. Like that was actually like one of my classrooms. So it was literally like walking through a forest. <laughs> you know, it was insane. It was such a beautiful thing. You know, it looked like this. 2 a.m. It looked like this. Midnight. It looked like this. Um, to also think about it. It's not just academics or personal. Just the experience you have is such a reward. Um, 
And so my ambitious little self went to Italy right after this. I did the summer and then I did a year in Florence. Um, I studied art, um, art history, Italian. Um, I am an art major. So for me, it was, it was like the paradise. Um, I, I loved it. And you know, some of the benefits of doing a year instead of the, instead of a summer or a semester um, is you really learn the language. I, unfortunately, I was in Italy when the pandemic occurred and I have my semester, my last semester was online. And so I can tell you like, you will regret it. I, you will regret it if you only spent a short amount of time because when you finally achieve, like you finally feel like a local, you finally like dominating the language, you know, con your connections, you have to go home and that, and that sucks. Like that really, it really breaks your heart. And so some of the advantages is that you know, by the end, I could dream in Italian, you know, I really started talking to them. I had a, so much fun, you know, scaring Italians because they would hear me speak English and then I would switch to Italian. And, you know, they treated me better for them. They made me feel very warm and they were so kind of like proud of me. They would tell me like, oh, because they saw me grow through the months of when I first arrived and I didn't know how to speak. And then all of a sudden I could ask him about the day and tell them about mine. Um, it was, it's such a unique experience. Um, and you become a local, you know, when you're studying in the country, you're not visiting, you're not a tourist, you live there. Um, and I cannot emphasize how essential that is um, because I, I learned everything from Florence, you know, I didn't need Google Maps. I, Florence is about the size of San Diego State, so it's small. So I made it my personal goal to never take a bus, never take a taxi. And you know what I did? I memorized the entire city. Um, people were actually very nice to me. We know when every time I went into a, a, a coffee shop, I was always treated with like, oh, the soto, which means treasure. And you know, um, the people around started knowing me and it was such a, a nice feeling, such a, a community, and you know, you feel like you're at home. It becomes literally your new home. And you know, something I I didn't expect, um, but I'm definitely very grateful is the connections you make. I I literally made family. Um, that was something I, you know, you hear like friends, it's really hard and you know, it's difficult because you're, you're alone out there and all of a sudden you have to like, kind of built your life again. Um, and that was something so unexpected and so nice that the connections I've made, you know, I feel I'm closer to the friends I made in Italy than I will, than I was with my friends here in San Diego. Um, and you know, I, professors are very different um, in Finland and in Italy. They were so approachable. Like it was very common for you to call them by their first name. Um, one of my professors actually um, from Italy, he would call himself like, I'm your grandpa, like we're here to help, like you can come to us, like if you want to kind of like travel around Italy, talk to us, we know Italy, like tell you what to avoid, where to go, like how to keep you safe. Um, another of my professors, she, I remember when we got the the unfortunate notice that we had to leave, um, Italy due to the pandemic, um, she, I remember she told me, I'm your aunt, I'm your adopted aunt, you know, here's my number, if you need anything, like, I'm here, and we have kept in touch, and, you know, she would actually help me with my Italian, um, through Zoom, and it was such a, a family connection, something that you don't really think you, it will happen until you're there, and all of a sudden, all those months have really prepare you, you know, that you have really created a, a new home. Um, and, you know, something that's really also important um, that I feel that it's not addressed enough is pick a country that you're passionate about that will really improve your skills. Um, I, like I said, I'm an artist. And I chose Italy because I wanted to learn how to be an artist. You know what better place than the Renaissance home? Um, and so 
I studied at uh, two schools. I chose a CSUIP program that allowed me to study at an, uh, an American university, the Florence Center, and the uh, Academia di Belliati, which is the first art school in the world. Like, what more can I ask for? It literally is the first. Like, it was created because of Michelangelo. It was a huge deal. Um, none of them spoke English. You know, it was an Italian or Italian school. It was hard, but you know, I learned so much, uh, not just because of the classes, um, but also because I was surrounded by art. You know, when you're walking through history, when you're walking in a city that's just devoted to something you're passionate about, you explore with it. You know, I was filled with creativity and you know, that was all I wanted to do. I wanted to draw. Some of these are literally me sitting at a plaza and just drawing what I would see. Um, so really try to pick a program that is kind of devoted to what you love. You know, it will literally kind of force you to, to grow. And so this was very ambitious for me, um, studying in Italy and then well, Finland. Um, and you know, I, I am not, I come from a pretty humble background, you know, I had to raise it all myself and I would have never been able to do this if it wasn't for the Gilman Scholarship. I am so thankful and grateful for them. Um, so what is it? Um, it's basically a scholarship that wants people like us, you know, people, um, students that will have the courage to go to a new country to learn, to like, growing what they're passionate about, their majors, they're even learning a new language. Um, this is a, a, a scholarship that is from the Department of State of Education. So it, it's like a huge deal. You know, I, I have this on my resume and this is something that's pretty prestige and well known um, because you, when you study abroad and you are a Gilman scholar, you are representing your country. No, you're not just, oh, yeah, you're saying, oh, you're from America. No, like, you are representing the country, and they will, they will take care of you. When I was stuck between countries of not being able to return home, they were one of the first people to contact me. Are you fine? Are you coming home? What's going on? Where are you going? Do you have a ticket? You know, they, throughout my time, if I needed anything, um, there was a specific phone number I could call if, like, I wasn't mentally okay, if I had an accident. You know, they really take care of you because they want their students to become international, to have that global mindset. Um, and so this is something um, very important for us as EOP Earth. Um, as you've noticed, um, not a lot of people study abroad. Like it's very, very low, especially now it's like, but before this whole pandemic, it was pretty low. So it, it's really hard to encourage students to actually like have the courage to do this because it's a lot of step. And so this is kind of like percentages of students that are awarded and oh, look what it says here, first generation college students, that's us. You know, a lot of us come from minorities and um, that's us again, you know. Um, undergraduates of high financial need. It's a lot of EOPers. Um, our school is represented. If you pick more than 140 countries, you know, it's they probably are awarding one of the countries you're interested in. So trust me, this is a scholarship that is looking for people like us, people that understand the value of this. Um, you know, for myself, my parents, my brother, my Cousins, they will never have the opportunities I have because of circumstance, because I, I am studying at San Diego State. I'm, I'm a first gen student. And you know, it's for us that some of these scholarships are created because we understand the value of hard work. We understand how difficult it is. And these scholarships just want to make it easier for us to live our dreams, you know, may have not just a dream, but a plan to make it happen. Um, and so these are some of the requirements, um, which most of us are, are eligible. Um, you have to be a U.S. citizen, an undergrad, um, 
most of us also receive financial aid. So we have a Pell Grant. Um, if it's a program through our um, study abroad office, you know, through Astics Abroad, boom, it's our academic cre um, credit. Um, all of our programs, I think the majority of them are a minimum of summer is three weeks. So if it's right in, um, I'm, there are obviously some changes that are going on due to everything that's happening. Um, so they are trying to award um, also students that are doing um, remote international programs. Um, like I said, half of my year was online and it was not the same experience, but it was definitely still very rewarding of having my Italian professors teach me so that they live there. Um, so that's something a new option for us now. Um, and so for this scholarship, you have to write two essays. The first one is the statement of purpose where you basically, um, they have specific questions you have to answer, but basically they just want to know why that country, why do you want to do this? Um, which is pretty simple. Um, it sounds pretty simple, you know, you just talk about why is it that you care, but it's, it's honestly quite hard when you talk, when you think, okay, I want to go and live my best life, but how do I write that in like a fancy term? You know, it's not that easy, um, but this is all about you. What is it that you want to achieve? And so the second part of the scholarship is writing an essay about um, how do you want to give back? Um, for me, you guys were one of the reasons I back a year ago, almost two years ago, I wanted to help other first generation students because I, I thought it was really hard. I had gone to a presentation like this my freshman year and I thought that was impossible. But it, it gave me hope, you know, it made me curious if like someone else like me did it, I can do it too. Um, so this project is basically, how do you want to give back? You know, if you want to address that, it's really hard as a woman, you want to specifically talk to women about having this opportunity, or, you know, maybe you're from a specific community that you want to address. You no, know, this is for you to be creative and just think about how you want to give back to others. Um, and so these are little tips of how, um, kind of things you should consider. This is not an essay. You can write overnight. It trust me, this is a really hard, um, essay because you have to reflect. You have to sit down and think, what do I want? And then, of course, you have to afterwards go and, like, proofread, have someone kind of like read it, does it make sense, um, kind of like small details that for academics we kind of know we should follow um, in essays. Um, and I want to specifically talk about my experience of how did I do it. Um, I got awarded a $5,000 scholarship directly to my bank account, directly. You know, not a lot of scholarships do that where here's money, whatever you need, it's here. Um, so that's pretty special. You know, this is a special scholarship. And I I didn't think I deserved this. You know, I didn't think I I had never been awarded a scholarship for merit for writing. I'm dyslexic essay writing is not my thing. Um, and you know, I sat down with my family and with some of my professors, my art professors, and I would talk about it. I felt like I don't deserve to study, for example, at the first art school. You know, I don't feel I'm prepared. I don't feel I'm that good of an artist. Like some of the kids back then, wow, it's like, it's, it's like photographs, it's incredible. And you know, they were the ones that kind of like, inspired me to write about myself because it's hard to write about yourself in such a like prestige way. Um, so definitely talk to people, talk, hey, what um, qualities do you see in me? Like they will give you ideas of, hey, you're a really hardworking person. Hey, you have, you know, you work at night shifts, you have done this, you have done that, you haven't stopped working and you deserve this opportunity. 
to live and experience that. You would have never had I been able to do it alone, you know? I remember I talked about um, being always having to work. I used to work night shifts and I felt really unsafe. Um, you know, I used to get out at mid, a little after midnight and I used to be so scared of like going home alone. Um, and I wrote about that, you know, I, I will have the funds. I feel like if, basically if I don't get the scholarship, like everything goes down, you know, have the courage to talk about why is it that you're passionate about what you are passionate about? You know, I grew up in a very um, different San Diego um, coming from Mexico. Well, you know, I used to get in trouble all the time for speaking Spanish and getting in detention. And I wrote about that, you know, it's something that art has let me done, you know, express myself without words. Being dyslexic, I don't always think with words. I think with um emotions with colors with images and you know that let me transmit myself express it so it's very important to me and you know have the courage to be vulnerable um also attend the sdsu writing center workshops they are so important they will help you they will break down each question of the gilman scholarship and you know they will basically tell you think about this kind of making it simple you know these were the workshops that made me reflect and think, okay, why is Italy important? Why Italy, you know? Why that program that I'm doing, the art one? Why this, you know, it's, you have to place yourself in a vulnerable position and you don't often know how to do that. And these workshops specifically for writing will help you think about that they will literally write down the question in a different setting so that we can understand it. You know, make it simple. Um, like I said, don't be afraid to get emotional in personal statements. Um, it's hard, trust me, it's so hard because sometimes we have, especially us, that we do not necessarily get the help of a normal person with um, kind of family that has been um, going to university for ages and hey you know what about this there's these opportunities we don't often find out about that you know we sometimes work twice as hard as some of our classmates um, and that's not fair but you know life isn't fair so don't be afraid of talking about it don't be afraid about I remember sometimes I would sit down and I would start crying because I would think you know this sucks, you know, if I, I don't have the resources, my family, no matter how hard they wanted to help me, could never help me achieve my dreams. Um, and you know, that's something very special. That's something very unique about us that we know the value about what we're doing. Um, and that leads me to a, a different, a very important step. Ask advisors to read your essay. <laughs> That is, it sucks being in the chair as someone's reading, you know, you're in that uncomfortable silence as someone is reading and they're marking your essay and you know, you wrote your soul, like you wrote, you know, very personal things and they're like, mm, no, it's, it's hard, you know, I remember um, the advisor that I have to thank that it was thanks to her that I wrote an incredible essay. I remember the first time I went um, she told me, you look too normal to have gone through all these hardships that you were expressing right here. And I remember I got so mad thinking, how dare you tell me I look too normal? Like, you don't know me, you know? Um, but then I understood, you know, um, I wasn't perhaps expressing myself. And she walked me through and showed me and kind of rearranged and talked to me. Why is this important? Tell me a little bit more about yourself. Um, tell me about this very important event that happened that kind of like made you who you are. And you know, it was those conversations, those very uncomfortable and difficult conversations that really squeezed me the words, like literally um, made me write the concise statements that helped me get the, the award, you know, she, that's what advisors do. 
they may seem tough and scary, but they just want us to succeed. They really have our best interests at heart. Um, specifically the ones that do the government, like the writing government workshops, they want us to succeed because they know we deserve this, you know, especially us. Um, <laughs> they know that we go through a lot of difficult things. Um, and so they really want us to succeed. Um, also, you know, sometimes before I, I would go to them, I would watch the government scholarship videos where I was an advisor talking about write about this, write about that, do not forget about the follow, follow up um, project, you know, and they would literally guide you through what you had to do. And sometimes, you know, I would sit down and, and take notes about um, what is it that I, I want to write about. Um, and also something I, through those videos that I think is very important of my own kind of like research is that they often express that students um, get too kind of like preoccupied with the personal statement essay, that they write a pretty okay follow-up project, but that that's how they notice, you know, do you understand how special what you're about to do is? Um, and sometimes that would, they would tell on the videos, that was what made students not get the scholarship because they kind of just wanted to go and live their own experience without thinking about how to give back to their community or give back to whoever was important to them. Um, and so that's something you also want to consider and think about, you know, who really matters? Um, who is something that, you know, that really concerns you? You know, for me, it was you guys, women, um, I remember also writing about um, kind of the fear I had with language, um, going to a different country for so long, not really speaking Italian. And you know, I that was something I wrote about. I want to come back and be a resource for anyone that's interested in Italy of being able to contact me and ask me questions. What is the, um, class schedule process like if I get there do I have to like know my classes what is the culture like um but what about language do I really like can I survive if I don't know it there's like little questions because when I studied abroad right before there wasn't really anyone that I could go and ask these questions there wasn't someone I could quickly send an email and be like hey um do they have a thick accent in Florence? Is it like a different Italian? Because I've been researching, studying an Italian that's from the South and it's, I read that they're not the same Italian. You know, little simple things or just what is the culture like? Um, you're dressing, I, that was something I wish I had known. Like Italians are so fashionable. Oh my God, like if they see you with jeans, they will treat you differently. Like they will know you're a tourist. You know, that was something I wish someone would have told me, like try to dress like them. They will be nicer. They will think that you are making an effort to adapt to their culture. You know, they will become nicer because they see you are trying. You're not here to kind of like bash and just kind of enjoy Italy on your own vision but you're trying to enjoy Italy as an Italian boy. Um, if you don't know, they're very proud of their country. Um, and so I remember I, I wrote about that, that I wanted other students to be able to contact me. And you know, so far they have, that's something I, I'm really happy that I have had a couple students email me and be like, hey, can I have a Zoom meeting with you and talk about my questions or if there's anything you can share about your experience. And, you know, helping them, you know, the same way I, I would have liked someone to have helped me. Um, and so, um, before I end, you know, studying abroad is, is something that really changes you. It's something that really, you don't understand the ways it will. I didn't get to travel a lot. I know a lot of people like to travel um, since everything is so close. Um, due to both 
study programs, I you know traveling was not really an option, like financially. Um, but it opens your mind, you know, especially for me, I was walking through history. I was walking, you know, sometimes I would walk around Florence. I went every day to see Michelangelo's David every single day. And, you know, it was such an inspiration of thinking, I am here. You know, it's something unbelievable. And, you know, when, when you share that back home, when you talk about your experience and you come back, it's something that no one can take away from you. You know, I want to share last, my, my last experience of Florence to kind of prove to you like what time does and you know what, you know, spending a lot of time in the country does to you. Um, so I, I have a libretto since I was studying at the academy, but just basically like a school ID and I could get it for free all the um, national museums of Italy for free. And so I took advantage of that. You know, sometimes I would walk into a museum, see three pieces that were my favorite and leave because I just wanted to see those three pieces. Or if I was sketching, I would go see one from the angles I needed and leave, you know, because I took such an advantage of it. And everything was going normal, you know, when you're enjoying life, you're enjoying Italy. And we got a notification that, hey, you guys have to leave in, in 24 hours. <laughs> you know, you, you have to return home. And that was really hard. That was heartbreaking. Um, I didn't really know where to return. I had no home in the US where I, I could stay in. And I had issues since I was representing, like I was a government scholar of returning to Mexico. There were like certain issues and it was a very difficult thing. And I remember, you know, when I got that, that notification, like you have to pack your stuff and like get out. What do you do with that time? You know, I received that email at two in the morning. I was still awake because you know, you're, you were nervous about what's gonna happen. And I remember in the morning, I put on my best outfit that I had learned from Italians of like some slacks, a nice coat, a little hat. Um, and I went to see my client, Los David. You know, in that moment, um, foreigners were not allowed inside any museum. No, because you know, they didn't know where you were coming from. Only Italian people could enter museums. But I wasn't gonna let that technicality like not let me say, say goodbye to, to the David. You know, it's my favorite piece. It was the reason I, I went to Florence. And so I put on my best outfit. I tried to like stay calm and I went to that museum. I went to um, the academy and I went through security. I got my ticket and nobody questioned. I wasn't Italian, nobody stopped me. I went and saw him. I was there for about an hour or two. It was empty. At first there was a, a couple, an Italian couple there, and then they left and it was just me with my favorite piece. And I remember I was sobbing and crying because I wasn't ready to say goodbye. I wasn't ready to say goodbye to being local, to being Italian. And I remember I, I also went to a couple other museums and nobody stopped me. And when I returned home that night, I remember I stopped and sat and realized that was the ultimate kind of Italian test. If I had learned Italian, if I had adapted. And you know, that's something very wonderful that time allows you, you know, when you're doing that, you become more than yourself. You know, I switch nationalities, like I put on hats because I have that experience. And that was something very wonderful um, that I, I got to say goodbye even though it was technically not legal. Um, and you know, that's something I recommend, you know, have the courage to go, to study abroad, to do it because it will change you. You will not realize it. I didn't realize how much I had adapted to their culture until I had to leave, you know, and I still wonder what would have happened if I had those other six, well, four, five months, what would have happened, you know, if I got to finish my second semester? Um, and 
no, let's think about yourself. You have no idea how that, that changed. You know, I came back and I got an internship in Paris. In Paris, my God, you know, I'm a little, no one from like nowhere. And all of a sudden I have these opportunities and doors open for me. You know, that will also happen to you and you don't, you don't even think about when you're applying. You just think about, oh, how exciting it's going to be. And you know, this pandemic won't last forever. Hopefully, you know, things will get better. We all take the precautions and everything will get back to normal. And I really, really hope you guys have the courage to, to do this because, you know, there are scholarships. There are so many scholarships. There are so many resources that want us specifically to succeed because they understand how hard it is for us to do so. And so they care about us more than anyone else. And, you know, from my program, I became um, an ambassador, a global ambassador for them. And I remember they told me after I shared my experience, I remember two of them told me, you know, we created these um, international study abroad programs for students like you. And, you know, I, that's still one of the best compliments I've ever received. And I can tell that to you, you know, they're looking for you. They really are. You just have to kind of believe in yourself too. And so um, thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. I would be more than happy to um, answer them. Yes, thank you, Paula. Uh, that was a beautiful and very inspiring presentation. I see that Ashley is raising her hand. Yes, so I have a quick question just because I've seen uh, uh, online, um, online, uh, when I enter the uh, study abroad page, um, it says that obviously like things have been canceled for um, like the 2020 year. So where do we see what programs are available for next year? Or has, have they not been available? Are they not available yet? I know Paola mentioned there was gonna be virtual, but what about like face-to-face? -face? Uh, this is Ryan, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer that. Um, uh, there have been some changes, unfortunately, as a result of the pandemic. Um, I would really encourage all of you to first visit the Aztecs Abroad database, and uh, you can see the full range of of programs that are normally offered there, and there are also uh, the virtual international programs that are now available and we're really emphasizing to folks because that doesn't require travel. Um, and the Gilman Scholarship is allowing people to use the scholarships for virtual programs now as well. Um, but go to the Aztecs Abroad database um, and uh, you can search for programs. You can complete our online advising phase there in Aztecs Abroad to uh, communicate your interest and questions to us. And then you uh, are able to come and visit with myself or one of the other study abroad advisors uh, uh, within a, a few days and, and we can talk to you about you know when you're planning to go and what programs may be available uh, for that term especially if you're thinking of this upcoming spring semester or next summer um, there have been a lot of changes and uh, things are changing almost by the day so uh, it's hard to answer that right this moment but I would encourage you to look at Aztecs Abroad and then come and see us. Okay thank you. And I'll put the I'll put the link in the chat here for everybody, um, so you can take a look. Thank you, Ryan. Um, we also have another question asking: When do you recommend we start applying for scholarships, depending on our study abroad date? Um, I would say you know for me it was the semester before I. I actually studied abroad, so it doesn't have to be like a year in advance. Obviously, um, if you really want to do your research in advance, you can start kind of writing the essays before. Um, the deadlines, I would recommend doing it a semester kind of before. I That's kind of what I did. Um, it takes a lot of time, so if you know like you're gonna have a, a really hard semester, do it a year before, you know, 
the more funds you get, you know, the more scholarships you apply, the more possibilities you have of actually being awarded. Um, right now, obviously, with the cancellation of programs and the insane amount of kind of like changes that are happening, um, it's really difficult to say when you will start, especially if you want to actually go to the country. Um, I think that most, the majority, um, I think as Ryan has said, um, scholarships are not kind of asking you for the amount of like their scholarship back if your program gets canceled. Um, so I would say apply, worst case scenario that your program gets canceled, you still have a scholarship, they will see if it's switched to virtual or if they just switch it to the next semester. I know CSUIP was doing that. So if like the spring program um, was canceled, they kind of just like switched you to the fall. Um, so it's kind of like there's going through a lot of switch of a lot of changes. Um, I don't know if Ryan has kind of another advice for like when is the best time to um, start applying. That's a um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, you you pretty much nailed it, Paula. I think it's really good for people to plan um, as early as possible. So even if you're a freshman now, um, come and see us. Start researching the options and come and see us if you're. A junior or senior come and see us soon and, and we can figure out if a um, if an international program um, you know what international program may be a good fit for you and what what time may be a good for you you also we would also really encourage you to talk to your academic advisors early on because they're familiar with your graduation plan uh, and your map and they may be able to give you a suggestion of oh it would be a really good idea if you went for a semester your sophomore year or if you studied abroad your junior year, um, given your major and your minor. Um, but yeah, start early if you can. And you know, touching that, I didn't touch it in my presentation, but don't be afraid of adding another year or a semester. I, I added another year um, to my academic, to everything. Um, I will be graduating with my major in art with two minors with the Honors College and I had to switch my my philosophy to Italian due to all those changes. And you know, once you graduate, unless you're planning to do like a, a graduate or master's, um, but even so you don't have the same opportunities like as in an undergrad, it's not the same kind of advantages and opportunities. So do not be afraid of adding a year you know, you, there's so much you can do at state. There's an endless list of possibilities. Do not be scared of, you know, having the time to explore. You know, I would have never, I was, I remember when I went to Ryan and I told him, hey, can I study abroad twice? And, you know, he was shocked. Nobody had ever done it. And he was like, well, yes, but I, yeah, I think so. And, you know, it became a wonderful journey. You know, don't be afraid of, you know, trying things, you know, adding more time so that you can have the full advantage of everything that a state has to offer. Uh, that, that's really good comments, Paula. I would also add, um, keep in mind that certain scholarships often will have a preference or really encourage people to study abroad longer term, longer than average, uh, you know, to gain that really genuine immersive cultural experience that Paolo was describing earlier. Uh, they want to use that those funds for the, the best investment, right? And so if you were choosing a program that was a full academic year, fall and spring semesters, uh, the Gilman Scholarship really, really likes to see that. A larger proportion of students will get a Gilman Scholarship for a semester or a year than the people that uh, are looking at just the minimum, you know, that three weeks, say, that short. If you can only do three weeks, right, if that's what you're comfortable with, then absolutely go after that and we can talk to you how, how you make that affordable and feasible. But if you're open for the reasons that we've outlined, we would really encourage you to think about um, a longer term. And also, you can use your federal financial aid for long semesters. So if you're eligible for federal financial aid, California financial aid, um, you can apply those in a semester, whereas you may not have those in the summer. I 
And I think we have another question. Can you study abroad during both summer sessions at state? Um, I can take that too. Um, there, there are different types of summer study abroad programs. Uh, so it may, um, they don't necessarily all neatly fit into the summer schedule at San Diego State. Uh, I guess I would put it, if you are interested in uh, a short summer program of two or three weeks long, you can do that. If you want to study abroad for, say, a little longer, four weeks, there are programs for that. If you would like to have a longer summer experience of, say, six or eight weeks, those also exist too. There's a lot of uh, flexibility with duration uh, in the summer. So, uh, and that also uh, aligns with or correlates with how many courses for credit you may want to enroll in one course, two courses, lots of flexibility. Thank you, Ryan. Um, has financing and has financing and scholarships changed with the recent world situation? Uh, generally, no. Um, students, uh, all of the standard study abroad scholarships that we encourage students to apply for, they're still active. Uh, the larger question may be if students are able to participate in that program, that study abroad program, if they're able to travel, uh, if they're able to get the visa that may be uh, necessary. So uh, definitely apply for scholarships for the term that you're planning to participate. And uh, we can talk to you about what contingency plan or what alternatives may be available if you're not able to participate in your, your, your primary option. But um, I imagine many of you, if not most of you, are thinking of an experience next summer and beyond. Um, so we're hoping that uh, a very large number of people are able to participate in programs next summer and beyond because it's you know, it's quite a few months ahead and we all hope that things continue to improve. Thank you, Ryan. Um, let me see. Another question regarding scholarships. Uh, there are more scholarships than just the Gelman and where can we see those scholarships to apply? Uh, good question. There are many scholarships listed in the Aztec Abroad database. I provided the link uh, earlier in chat. So mm -hmm. if you click the financing and scholarships link in the Aztec Abroad database, then you can see uh, many of those study abroad specific awards. I would also really encourage all of you to submit the general Aztec scholarships application through the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships. So that will make you eligible for general SDSU awards that may not be specific to study abroad. So make sure that you're submitting that general one application for all SDSU scholarships. Uh, and I'll, I'll also, also highlight there's the Associated Students Study Abroad Scholarship. All of you are SDSU students, so make sure you apply for the AS Study Abroad Award too. And then also about how to cover study abroad. Does FAFSA cover study abroad? Uh, in, in short, yes, FAFSA is simply the, the free application to determine your eligibility for federal and state financial aid. So make sure you submit the FAFSA application each academic year. You may uh, get assistance and support from uh, the financial aid office and your family to do that. But make sure you submit FAFSA. And if you're eligible for federal financial aid, like the Pell Grant, or loans or the California grants, then you can use those on uh, many semester long study abroad programs. So as long, if you're thinking of a fall or spring or academic year program, yes, you can use your FAFSA determined aid. Adding to that for myself in Italy, I took all my financial aid, everything that San Diego offers to me when I study at state, I took that to Italy. So I had my Pell Grant, I had my account grant, I had um, the, I think it's the student something, I, I think it's an SDSU scholarship specifically, that's also um, 
and uh, there's an EOP uh, scholarship that some of us receive so I also took that so I took everything with me so depending on your program also um, you can ask our um, financial uh, office of financial aid and scholarships they will be more than happy to help you and guide you through everything um, that you will be awarded because for me that was that was an incredible help a lot of grants you know I had to take out a loan but I was able to switch everything and it was very easy and simple so definitely look at that Um, looks that that's the end of the questions. So thank you again, Paola and Ryan for being here. Um, I really, really enjoyed your presentation as, I, as I'm sure everyone did. Um, yeah, thank you again. And I'll, I'll leave this open for a little bit to see if there's any more questions or people who wanna meet with you. Um, all of the participants, you all receive an email after with some of the links that were included in this presentation. and. If it's okay with Paula, I can also add your contact information. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. See you soon. See you soon. Thank you, Ryan. I think it's just us, Paola. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. It was beautifully done, and I thought your words were very inspiring. Well, thank you. Yeah, have congratulations. A, have a good one. Yeah, thanks. You too. Uh, congratulations for all of your awards, and I hope to hear from you soon, too. <laughs> thank you. Bye.